welcome. We are in Senior English A. And our objective now for the hour is to answer a very simple question. Why does Beowulf do what he does? But that's kind of a first layer question. There's a second layer question. It runs something like this. Why do superheroes do what they do? I mean, seriously? Dude, if you can jump off the ground and fly through the air, Superman, if you can shoot little thingies out of your wrists and stick to places and swing around, Spider-Man, do you not realize you just immediately became the richest, most powerful person in the world? Think of this. You can go in any bank and hold it up and, come and walk out with the stuff. You can be the most challenging villain, bad guy, and there's nobody to stop you. Why do superheroes behave positively and not negatively? See, it's the same question. What do they hope to gain by it? Ah, there's another way to write it down. Maybe that's a good way to write it down in our notes. What does Beowulf hope to gain in the three battles of the Beowulf epic? And by the way, there's an answer to this. We are told in the very epic itself why Beowulf does what Beowulf does. We want to pay attention to it. Here's why. Beowulf, the epic poem, is going to be instructional manual for Anglo-Saxon warriors. They will look at this poem as a way to know how best to live their life. We are looking at an early English poem. Our own culture is a byproduct of the English culture which will explain why even today we play the same game of superheroes, we play the same game of celebrating of certain individuals. Why is it every time you watch a football game, in the introductory comments, they always call out one or two important players on the team? Why is that? Let's be fair. No matter how amazing the quarterback is, if the center doesn't snap the ball to him, he will never do anything. No matter how amazing a, a, a hitter is in volleyball, she can do nothing if the ball isn't set for her. Right? Think of it in terms of cheerleading. You can do all the funny stuff you want to do up in the air, but somebody's got to hold you up there. Right? See, in other words, it's always a team. Why do we celebrate one person above the team? See, this is an interesting question. The answer, by the way, for us is the Anglo-Saxon code. Let's now write that in our notes. The Anglo-Saxon code, C-O-D-E. When we study the Beowulf epic, and more particularly his motivations for behavior, we're going to come up with three different motivators. And we're going to see these motivations right away. I'm going to begin with you on page 47 of your hymnal. And we're going to be looking at now several speeches of Beowulf. Now, can I say this out loud, Ms. Flinter? When you look at the Beowulf epic, there's two parts. Now, I know there's three parts in terms of the monsters, but I'm talking about two different parts. One part, the action of the epic. When he fights with Grendel. When he fights with Grendel's mom. When he fights with the dragon. That's the action of the epic. Part two, the speeches of the epic. Before Beowulf ever goes into fight, he always gives a speech. Those speeches, interestingly, are the boring part of the poem. And so often they don't make it into the textbook that you're looking at. So you're not looking at the entire text of Beowulf. Your textbook company will provide you with the action of the poem. Very rarely are they going to emphasize the language, the speeches of the poem. We're going to want to pay attention to the speeches because it's in the speeches we're going to learn about why he does what he does. Let me give you a classic example. Beowulf lives in the land of the Geats. He hears about this monster in the land of the Danes. He has never been to Denmark. Are you ready for this? The Danish people don't even know he exists. He's a nobody. He shows up at the lands of the Danes. He goes into Rothgar's hall at Herod, and he says what? Well, I'm on page 47. Let's take a look at it. He will speak to the king. I'm on page 47. And the first thing he does, uh-oh, right away, we're teaching young soldiers how you're supposed to behave in front of a king. Hail Rothgar. You show respect. You show respect. Have you heard an old man or an old woman recently say, kids today show no respect? That's a very Anglo-Saxon thing. Really? Why should I show you respect just because you're older than me? 
Have you found any of these old people that don't even like you to wear your ball cap inside the house or inside the school? Yeah. It's a fair question to ask. Dude, what's wrong with wearing a ball cap inside of a building? I can give you one quick answer now. It's an Anglo-Saxon thing. It's called respect. When many years ago, maybe your, your parents will maybe tell you this, uh, when they were young, it was still the case in American culture, and some of you maybe are still aware of this, that if you're sitting down and an old person walked into the living room, all the young people had to stand up. You offered your chair to the old person. See? Some of us know this, right? We still live in a time where some houses, you're taught this. What is that about? What are you talking about? Dude, I got the seat first. The old fart walks into the room. Let them find their own chair. Way wrong answer. It's the R word. It's respect, right? You stand up many, many years ago in school. When the teacher walked into the room, all of the children in elementary school had to learn to stand up as soon as the teacher walked in. They did not sit down until they were told to with the term at ease. For those of us who know anything about the, meta, about the military right world, we know that's the case. You stand in front of your person who is in charge, erect, until told at ease. Students were not allowed to speak to the teacher, answer questions. If I called on Mr. Hernandez, he would have to stand up. And he would say, Mr. McGee, the answer is, and then he would wait for me to allow him to sit back down. Of course, some of you were taught you raised your hand in school to ask a question. You remember that? The old days? You had to raise your hand, right? We don't even do this very much anymore now, do we? Raise your hand. What's that all about? Again, it's back to respect. Where's this respect thing come from? I'm looking at it right here. This is one of the early examples of it. Hail Rothgar, he hails him. Hygelic is my cousin, that is to say where he comes from, Beowulf is speaking here, and my king. The days of my youth have been filled with glory. Uh-oh, Mr. Rothlinger, we're going to find a word here that's really important. We're going to write it in our notes. What is this G word? Glory. What is that word? And give it a definition. Jim, you got a definition for us for glory? What is glory? My days have been filled with glory means what? Winning. Keep going. Winning. Good stuff. Lots of praise, glory. People think good or bad of me. Really good. This is where the whole notion of reputation is going to start. What people think of you matters to an Anglo-Saxon. To an Anglo-Saxon. This is old school. You can write it in your notes as that. We're looking at old school code. This is Anglo-Saxon code. What matters? The way people think of you. What do you got to get? Glory. Glory, glory. You want people to talk about you. Keep reading with me. Now Grendel's name has echoed in our land. Sailors have brought us stories of Herod, the best of meat halls, deserted and useless when the moon hangs in skies and sun had lit. Light and life fleeing together. My people have said, the wisest, most knowing and best of them, that my duty was to go to the Danes' great king. Oh, whoa, whoa, what was that D word? You just read a word. You're going to write that word down. What's that word you just read? It was my what? My duty. Whoa, 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 what's a duty? Something you're obligated to do. Whoa, now she used the O word. Obligated. What does that mean? Something you do not because you want to, but because you have to. That's called duty. You have some ability. You must use that ability. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This begs a really intriguing question. If you're not a part of the club or the team or the group, but you could make that team or club better, do you have an obligation? Do you have a duty to do that? I don't want to do that. I don't care. Whoa, whoa, that wasn't our question. We're not asking what you want. We're asking, do you have a duty? What's the Anglo-Saxon answer, by the way? You bet. If you have the ability to help the group, if you have the ability to help the club, if you have the ability to help the team win, and you don't do it, according to the Anglo-Saxons, you're not doing your duty. I don't care about my duty. What would the Anglo-Saxons say about that? You'll never gain any, what's the G word? Respect. 
Respect is the art word. You'll never gain any respect. You'll never gain any glory. Absolutely right. Notice the, notice the suggestion. It's a powerful observation. Right? We've had this over the years, this discussion in room 303. But I don't want to be on the team, so I quit. The Anglo-Saxon question is simple. Can you help the team? Well, yeah. You can help the team win. Well, yeah. Ooh. But I don't want to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Notice here. There is no want in this passage. Beowulf says, my people have told me it is my duty. We have found the first motivation for Beowulf's actions. He will tell King Rothgar, I have come here to fight against Grendel because I have to. What do you mean you have to? It's our O word. It's obligation. Why? Because Beowulf has a skill set nobody else possesses. Beowulf can defeat Grendel, therefore, Beowulf should defeat Grendel. Now that's an interesting question. Just because you can do something, does that mean you have a moral obligation to do it? <clears throat> See, we struggle with this. Th can, can we point out, this is how our culture is moving away from the Anglo-Saxon code. If you have the ability to do well in school, you have a good mind. You know you could get more, higher grades than you get. Do you have a moral obligation to do that? No. You know, if, you, if your parents raise you with those morals. My parents tell me to. But See, this is a good question. We, we can debate this. Just because I can do something, does that mean that I should do that thing? If it helps other people. Then yes. There's an interesting observation. The Anglo-Saxon code says, if, if it helps other people, then this is a no-brainer. But what about, for example, getting good grades? For example, you have a son someday in the future who is really, really brilliant. But in ninth grade, he comes home with a report card of all Fs. And he says, you, you say to him, son, you don't get this. You have the ability to get really good grades. You should have all A's. You can read better than anybody else in your class. And you got all Fs. And the kid says back, I do not, what's the C word? I do not care. What's the Anglo-Saxon code say about why your son should excel in school? Is it for himself? No. It's got nothing to do with himself. Well, who's it for then? If it's not for yourself, who's it for? The parents. We could say the group. We could say the parents. We could say the nation. We could say the tribe. The rest of everybody else. Is there a selfish approach here as well that you can take in regards to the group? Yeah. You bet there is. Think of it this way. What about the fact that if you, for example, go into the doctor to have to have surgery, would you prefer to have surgery from the doctor who did really good in ninth grade in school or did really crummy in ninth grade in school? If you had a choice, which doctor are you choosing to work on you or on your loved one? That seems like a no-brainer. Right? You obviously want the doctor that did well in school. What about the mechanic that works on your vehicle? You want the mechanic that got D minuses when they taught about engine work? Or do you want the mechanic who really overstudied the material? What about the one fixing your brakes? Yeah. See, it's funny how that works. All of a sudden, this isn't a personal choice. This has to do with there are other people who rely on the choices you make. Can you live with that? See, this is this Anglo-Saxon code. Number one, can I fight against Grendel? Notice he keeps going. They have seen my strength for themselves. I'm at the top of page 48. Watched me rise from the darkness of war, dripping with my enemy's blood. I drove uh, five great giants into the ch into the chain with into chains. Chased all the race of the earth. I swam into the darkness. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This sounds almost like he's what? Bragging. It, yes. Let's write this down. This almost sounds like he's bragging a little bit. Let me tell you how great I am. These are all the things that I've done. If you talk about things you've actually done, is that bragging? Well, it's like trying to show the other person, like, perhaps perspective. This is like showing his resume, isn't it? Let me show you all the things I've done. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Therefore, you ought to give me the chance at Grendel, right? He's trying to make the argument, Grendel should be afraid of me. Notice he says, 
at lines 2, uh, 59 and following. This one favor you should not refuse me. Line 260 on page 48. I'm giving you line numbers so that you know what to quote when you write your paper, right? That I alone, notice it though, and with the help of my men, may purge all evil from this hall. He says, let me fight against this monster. I want to go against them, and I want to do it barehanded. In the process, I can maybe gain a little bit of glory. Right? Reason number one, Beowulf will act glory, but more particularly, do. Beowulf defeats Grendel, tears off the arm, hangs it up as a trophy. Away goes the body of Beowulf, I'm sorry, of Grendel. Grendel goes into the moors where under the ground he dies. Mama, not pleased. Under cover of night, we're told, she returns. Now, the next set of lines we don't have in our book. That's why we're looking at our packet, and we're going to page 5 now. And the next set of lines are going to speak about maybe a second reason for Beowulf to behave and to fight, only this time now against Grendel's mom. We're told that Beowulf is summoned, and at the top of page 5 of your packet, he will ask, how's it going? To which Hrothgar, the lord of the Skildings, the lord of the Danes, will respond, Oh, ask not of pleasure. Are you reading with me? Top of page 5 of your packet. Top of page 5 of your packet. I'm on a left-hand column there. Ask not of pleasure. Pain is renewed for the Danish people. Asher is dead. You see the ellipsis? That means it goes on for quite a while. Oh, this is terrible. He was my comrade, closest of counselors, my shoulder companion, the old fart, Rothgar. Oh, we thought we had all our problems solved with the killing of Grendel. Grendel has a ma. She came back. She ate my best friend Asher up. It's terrible. My life stinks. And he goes on, all the way down the left side, on to the right side. He goes on for quite a while. Can you just put it in one word? He's whining, isn't he? The old man's whining. Everything is terrible. This is bad. Things are terrible. Positive or negative view? Obviously, very negative view, right? Oh, this is terrible. Then we're told at lines 895, and you want to circle that number down. Lines 895 and following, we're going to get Beowulf speaking. Why these lines are not in your hymnal, I do not know. They are some of the most important lines in the entire epic of Beowulf, and they are powerful as a teacher of what the Anglo-Saxon code actually is. Here we go. Beowulf spoke son of Ecthiel. By the way, let's make a note for ourselves. In the Beowulf epic, we learn that who you come from matters. Did you notice I said who and not what and not where? Did you notice that? Notice it's Beowulf, son of Ecthiel. We don't know anything about Ecthiel other than he was the daddy of this guy. In other words... You're always interested in where you came from, which is why your last name matters, right? Your last name says something about who you are and where you come from. And in Anglo-Saxon culture, that matters. So notice, we're told who his daddy is. Look at what he says. Sorrow not, brave one. All right, here we go. Now we're ready to start reading some lines. You definitely are going to quote these. I'm on page five of your packet. I'm on the right-hand side. I'm at line 896. Beowulf speaking to the old fart Hrothgar, the king who now cannot fight his own battles. He needs the help of Beowulf. Look what he tells him. Sorrow not, brave one. Better for man to avenge a friend than much to mourn. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Put this in your own words, in your notes. What has he just said? What has he just said? This is an important Anglo-Saxon code. Again, page 5 of your packet. Lines 896, 897. Put it in your own words. Sorrow not, brave one. Right? Don't be sad. Then look at the next one. Better for man to avenge a friend than much to mourn. Put it in your own words. What's he tell the old fart? Don't sit around here crying. Do what? Get vengeance. Somebody's getting jacked. In other words, you mess with one of us, we mess with you. Vengeance. 
Don't stand around whining about it. Don't be a whiner. Yeah, don't be a whiner. I've had a lot of ball players and wrestlers and athletes that like this. Wow, this sounds kind of like a coach or two I know. Stop whining. Get up and go to work. Enough with the crying. We don't need whiners. We need doers. Get up and go to work. Look at what he says next. Better for a man to avenge a friend than much to mourn. All men must die. Let him who may win glory ere death. Whoa. There's the G word. Everybody's got to die. What do you got to do before you go? Put it in your own words, write it in your notes. What's he saying? Before you go, you got to do something before you leave. Everybody's going to die. There ain't no point in being afraid of it. There ain't no point in worrying about it. Everybody's got to die. When is the last 200-year-old person you met? Yeah, it doesn't happen. Everybody goes bye-bye. You do not get to stay here forever. That is a fundamental truth of the Anglo-Saxon code. Nobody gets to live for very long. But before you die, you better get some what? You better get some... What's the word here used? You're right. Glory is the word word here used. Let's go ahead and though use the word that we probably would say of our own now, respect. That's it. I want respect before I go. And if I want respect, I got to earn respect. Boy, this is foundational in the Anglo-Saxon Code. Nobody gives you anything in the Anglo-Saxon Code. You get up... And you go get it for yourself. You earn the respect by doing something. Right? Take a look. He keeps going. He says, Better for man to avenge a friend than much to mourn. All men must die. How is it possible these lines are not in our anthology? I don't know. Let's follow it. Let him who may win glory ere death, that guardian. You might circle that word guardian. It means treasure. That guardian or treasure is best for the noble man when his name survives him. There it is. See, it's an interesting question. If you went away tonight, you just stopped breathing. What would they say about you? Died. What would they say about you? And who is the they? See, the Anglo-Saxon code says... You live your life for one primary reason, and that is so they have something to say about you after you go. Who are the people in your life that would say anything about you? Do you have those people in your life? See, and what would they say about you? And what you want them to say about you, you have to decide now. That's what Babel is telling Rothgar. It's time to go to work. Your life is lived so that after it's gone, people remember you. Ah, now we understand why we take pictures of athletes and put them in a whole closet out here. See? Why? To be remembered. Right? That's the point of the Anglo-Saxon code. Some of you will say, yeah, I don't really care about being remembered. Well, yeah, see, we're we're moving beyond the Anglo-Saxon code, aren't we? See, maybe a time has changed. We can have that debate. Is it a different time today? Or do we still have this sense of doing something that allows for us to be remembered? Especially if you can. If you have the ability to do something to be remembered, shouldn't you do it? Do you have a duty to try to gain respect? Keep going, he finishes. That guardian is best for the noble man when his name survives him. Then let us rise up, O ward of the realm, and haste us forth to behold the track of Grendel's dam. I give you pledge. Here it is. He makes a promise. He makes a promise to the king. I give you pledge. She shall not in safety escape to cover, to earthly cavern, or forest fastness, or gulf of ocean. Go where she may. This day with patience. Endure the burden of every woe, as I know you will. End quote. Notice what the poet tells us next. Up sprang the ancient. What does that mean, Mr. Hernandez? Up sprang the ancient means what? How about it, Jimmy? What does it mean? Up sprang the ancient means what? He's sitting down. He's whining. He's crying. Things are not going well. All of a sudden, Beowulf speaks, and what does he do? Yeah, he jumps up. The, the, The old man is rejuvenated by the words of Beowulf. They pick him up. 
right? They get him ready to go. Some of you are familiar with before a contest, sometimes a coach will come in and speak words that motivate. And then all of a sudden, everyone ready to go, right? Pick up. Notice, up sprang the ancient, gave thanks to God for the heartening words, and there it is. Do you see the lines? What is Beowulf called? It's one of the few, first times he's called this in the poem. What's he called? The what? There it is. That's the key word. And that's the answer to the second motivation. Beowulf wants to be a hero. Now that's an interesting question. What is a hero? Somebody that everybody looks up to. Let's define it as an individual others aspire to be like. They look up to them. Right? Now, in the Beowulf epic, who is the identifiable hero? Beowulf, right? Question. Two parts. For your notes. Do we still need heroes today? Do people live needing heroes today? Everybody needs somebody to look up to. People need someone to look up to as they live their life. Some people try so hard to be a hero, they go and get themselves killed, though. Heroes sometimes must die. But Heroes sometimes must like, die. How people talk about you after, it's like somebody that... To be remembered you, after your death. It inspired, they inspire you to do better than what you're doing. Right Who are the heroes of the culture now? Write down. Who are the individuals that are considered the heroes today? We look, for example, to different venues, don't we? We look to entertainment. We look to music. We look to sports. Right? Who are, for you, the people who you look at and say, I kind of like to be like them? See, this is a two-part question. Who are the people that you look at now? Maybe more intriguingly, when you were 10 years old, who were the people that you looked at? See? Because I often will remind high school seniors, you learned how to be a high school student when you were 10 by looking at high school seniors. Now, let's be fair. You didn't realize that's what you were doing. When you went to ball games as a little kid, you weren't watching the ball game as much as you were watching the kids at the ball game. You didn't realize it at the time. You learned how they dress. You learned how they walk. You learn how they talk. That is how you grow up. You learn to grow up by watching people who are older than you. Question. Are you prepared to say right now to fifth graders, when you're a high school senior, I want you to be just like me. Just do it, just like I do it. Are you prepared to say that to, to fifth graders? See, the, the Anglo-Saxon code says, if you answer that question is no, it's too late. Fifth graders are already watching you to see how they're supposed to live to be a senior. They're already watching. You don't get to say to them, don't watch me. It's not the way it works. Because children grow up to be what they've seen. That's the Anglo-Saxon code. That's the way it is. Are you prepared to say to a bunch of fifth graders, do it like me. And if you're not, the Anglo-Saxon code says, why not? Why not? In other words, you live your life in such a way that those who are younger than you want to aspire to be like you. Those who are older than you give you respect. And when you die, Somebody remembers you. That is foundational Anglo-Saxon code. It will become one of the most important ideas in the history of Western thought, which is why your anthology begins with the Beowulf epic. That's why. Which is why we take pictures and put them on cardboard and stick them out there. Which is why we have students of the week. Which is why we have people mentioned at all who are pulled out. Most of the time they are mentioned because they are important in the culture. But are, it, it, do we still play this game? See, that's my question. Do we still believe in this notion of heroes who should be emulated in some way? Finally, number three. See, we're, we're working on our paper as well, right? Number three. 
The third monster. Well, we're told that Beowulf's, Be Beowulf kills the monster, right? Turn your uh, packet to page six. At the end of part two, there is a very famous speech that, that Hrothgar will give. The king, the old king, he gives a speech. In front of Beowulf, he calls all of the soldiers together. I'm on page six of your packet. And I'm at lines 1160 and following. Notice a few lines before that. Then outspoke Hrothgar Heffelding's son, and all the retainers were silent and still. There it is. If your king speaks, if somebody older speaks, younger people silent and still, listening. Take a look at what he says. Well may he say whose judgment is just, recalling to memory men of the past. This earl was born of a better stock. Wow, there you go. Beowulf. You're a better man than most everybody else. You come from good stuff. Your fame, we might circle that word. Uh-oh, there it is. That's the F word, huh? In the Anglo-Saxon code, what's the F word? Fame. Fame. Your fame, friend Beowulf, is blazoned abroad over all white ways to every people. In manful fashion, have you showed your strength, your might, and your wisdom. You might want to circle all three of those. To be an Anglo-Saxon soldier, warrior, you got to have three things. Strength, might, and wisdom. We might think of strength as physical strength. We might think of might as courage. Just because you're strong doesn't mean that you'll always use that strength. Sometime in the moment of greatest challenge, some people run away. How do you account for the fact that some people quit? See, the Anglo-Saxon code asks this question. Why is it some people quit? They're capable. They've got, their, they've got strength. What they lack is might, courage, to use their strength. Why? Well, there's a, this is a tough question. Maybe they're afraid of failure? Maybe they've done it for so long that they're kind of tired of doing it? Maybe they just don't understand the importance of their life and the moments that they have to live their life with courage. Notice the last one. Wisdom. That's not intelligence, is it? That's the ability to use your intelligence in some kind of kind way. Wisdom. My word I'll keep, the plighted friendship we formerly pledged, long shall you stand as a state of your people. And then it's interesting. Rothgar pauses for a moment. Are you reading with me at lines 1169 and following? Tis a wondrous marvel how God in his gracious spirit bestows on men the gift of wisdom, goodly lands, princely power. He rules over all. This is some of the Christian elements of this poem. God makes people to have a good life, he says. He suffers a man of lordly line to set his heart in his own desires, awards him fullness of worldly joy, a fair homeland, the sway of cities, the wide domain of many a realm, an ample kingdom, till, you might circle the word, cursed with folly. The thoughts of his heart take no heed of his end. Whoa, what's Rothgar say? It's a fascinating thing he says to study a guy. Right? You live, you've got great health, you got lots of money, you got lots of power, everything is going your way. You don't think about the fact, take no heed of your end means what? You forget that sooner or later you gotta do what? Yeah, you gotta grow old and die. It's like I said once to a ball player who had quit mid-season. I said, here's the deal. Someday you're gonna have a boy, a son, and he's gonna come up to you and he's gonna say, I'm thinking about quitting. What do you think? And you're either gonna tell him what you did or what you should have done. That's the Anglo-Saxon code, right? It's interesting how we forget about the future. Unmindful of the future, we make our decisions. Notice we continue, till cursed with folly, the thoughts of his heart take no heed of his end. He lives in luxury, knowing not want, knowing no shadow of sickness or age, no haunting sorrow darkens his spirit, no hatred or discord deepens the war. The world is sweet to his every desire, and evil assails not until, you might circle the word again, in his heart, pride, overpowering, gathers and grows. And we want to put a square around the word pride. This is a powerful Anglo-Saxon message. Beware of pride. The warder slumbers, the guard of his spirit, too sound is that sleep, too sluggish the weight of worldly affairs, too pressing the foe. The archer who looses the arrows of sin. Then 
Is his heart pierced? Are you reading it with me? I'm at line 1191. These are really important lines. Then is his heart pierced under his helm, his soul in his bosom with bitter dart. He has no defense for the fierce assaults of the loathsome fiend. What he long has cherished seems all too little. As you get older, you get grumpy. And you don't care about the stuff you used to care about. In anger and greed, he gives no guardian of plated rings since God has granted him glory and wealth. You might underline the next line. He forgets the future, unmindful of fate. That's the other F word in the, in the code. And it says, fate's coming. Bad stuff happens just the way life is. But it comes to pass in the day appointed, his feeble body withers and fails. Death descends and another seizes his hoarded riches and rashly spends the princely treasure, imprudent of heart. Beloved Beowulf, here it comes. Best of warriors, avoid such evil. Seek the good, the heavenly wisdom. And then there it is. You might circle it. Beware of pride. Now for a time, you shall feel the fullness and know the glory of strength. But soon, here it comes. He says, yeah, of course you're the biggest stud on the planet now. But not for long. Soon, what's going to happen? Sickness. This is, by the way, the way Anglo-Saxon warriors can die. They got a number of ways to get jacked. Sounds kind of familiar. Sickness or sword shall strip you of might or clutch of fire or clasp of flood or flight of error or bite of blade or relentless age or the light of the eye shall darken and dim and death on a sudden the lordly ruler shall lay you low. A hundred half years I've been ahead of the rain Danes, defending the folk against many a tribe with spear point and sword in the surges of battle, till not one was hostile neath heaven's expense. But a loathsome change swept over the land, grief after gladness, when Grendel came. In other words, the old fart Rothgar says, dude, I was once just like you. I was a superhero. I could take care of all my own business. And then I got old. And then Grendel showed up. And then I needed your help. In other words... Be aware, you're going to get old. Part three. What happens? He gets old. Then a dragon shows up. And he says, I'm going to go fight against the dragon. But guess what? He can't defeat the dragon without his help. Without, um, young that one guy, that Unferth. Guy. Yes, young Unferth. The only way Beowulf can win this one is with the help of the younger person. Why does Beowulf go fight against the dragon? For one last What's thing. one last fight? Keep going. Out of his to get the, the dragon out of his land. In other words, he's helping his people. people. Yes. Let's write it down. The third motivation for Beowulf is because he wants to leave behind something for his people. He has become a leader. Unlike in the first two, he's responsible to large numbers of people. This is part of the Anglo-Saxon code. You are a part of the group. You're always a part of the group, and you have to take care of the group in your own way. You have to take care of the group, right? So he kills the dragon, and what does he will for the good of the people? All of the treasure to be shared with all the people, right? In other words, he is, what's our G word? Generous. There it is. Write it down. He is generous in his death. He's generous in his death. And most importantly, he has to be remembered how? Through the construction of what? A lighthouse. He wants to be remembered through construction of a lighthouse. Some way to remember him after he's dead and gone. All right, guys.